If you've ever used a website like WebND, then you already know that you've got cats. <laughs> Strong opening, right? <laughs> Kevin, who wrote this script is so true. Like anytime you're like, ooh, that feels a little bit weird. Let's look it up on MD, MD WebMD. Or like, that looks a little bit strange. What's this, WebMD? Well, it's probably this, but it could also be cancer. What are you doing, Scott? I'm wishing cancer upon you. Cancer? That's right. I'm trying to give you cancer with my mind. It doesn't matter what symptoms you want to investigate, the answer is always cancer. You might believe that you suffer from every single disease that you ever read about, a condition referred to as medical student syndrome. It's a common condition, but usually it just results in general fear rather than symptoms of actual hypochondria. Yeah, because hypochondria is like thinking you're sick, but if you're a medical student, it's like, oh no, it's actually fear because you're like, oh my god, look at all these horrible diseases that people can get. I remember there was a, an article, it was in a magazine like years ago or whatever, and it was called like, How Doctors Die. And it just struck me so hard. I was a kid or whatever. I was just reading it, or like a young adult or whatever. I was just reading this article. I think it was a New Scientist or something like that. And it was basically like, yeah, when a doctor gets a terminal diagnosis, they don't try and they're not like, oh, let's do this procedure, let's do that procedure, because they know how f they are. They're just like, nope, not gonna do that. Not gonna do this because maybe it'll get me six more miserable months, and I know I'm going to die, and I know what it's like. And it's like, holy. Sh <laughs> That really struck me. It's easy to read about a rare and terrifying condition and assume that your symptoms line up with it, even if they're far more likely to be something else. For example, I suffer from insomnia, anxiety, and being easily agitated. Doesn't everyone suffer from being easily agitated? <laughs> Isn't it just me? <laughs> me and Kevin. According to the symptoms listed here on WebMD, that means that I might be suffering from rabies. <laughs> Fucking hell, you better hope not. <laughs> I mean, but also, on the other hand, there's nothing you can do, so fuck it. Sure, I don't have any of the other symptoms of rabies, and it certainly makes more sense that my symptoms are caused by caffeine, nicotine, and being a dick, but I can't really rule out rabies, can I? While these- <laughs> yes, you can. It's like, have you been bitten or scratched by a rabid animal recently? If the answer is no, then you're okay. Rabies is King terrifying, by the way. While these disastrous self-diagnoses are something we can all easily fall victim to, you probably don't have to worry about diagnosing yourself with any of the diseases that we'll be talking about today. These are bizarre diseases with unique and unmistakable symptoms that in the case of the first two we'll be talking about are not nearly as fun as they initially sound. Are we going to be talking about that one where people are always drunk? We yeah. Spoilers. Because there's like this sim syndrome where it's like you eat bread or whatever and it ferments in your tummy and then it just releases alcohol into your body so you're always drunk. <laughs> Which sounds great until you realize that you'd rather not be drunk all the time. Just before we continue with today's video, I do want to take a moment to talk about a product that is keeping my feet dry every day and has done for years, and that would be honestly one of my favorite sponsors, and that's Vessi. Look, though it's it's winter. The weather can change at a moment's notice. Suddenly, like I don't know, I work all day. I don't even go outside and I leave outside, it's pouring with rain. And I'm like, well, not to worry. Grab the umbrella, and I'm already wearing my Vessies, which are waterproof. They use something called Dymatex technology, which uh, it means your feet can breathe, so your feet don't get all sweaty, but also via, I would say magic, but it's Dymatex, via Dymatex, they, uh, there's, there's no water getting in, and they don't look like waterproof boots at all, like these things especially. Vessie just sent these to me, and I'm like, normally, I keep them all nice and clean to show you guys on camera, but instead, I was going to Iceland for the weekend. <laughs> And it's going to be really cold. So I was like, I'm sorry I'm wearing these. I don't have any good winter boots yet. And they've got this beautiful fleece lining. They kept my feet warm all weekend, even in Iceland, which is really cold and dark and grey. And now there seems to be going to be a volcano going off. But anyway, that's not relevant. I wore these shoes like I wear Vessies all the time. And they're just fantastic. They're just, you can't go wrong. I'm sorry, I'm so far off the talking points. I think these are the Soho ones that I should also talk about. These just look great. Like I wouldn't wear these in Iceland because, I mean, I would. They'd still keep your feet warm. Just not as warm as these, but it's all perfect stuff. It's really good. Don't wear any other shoes. Just get Vessies. Plus they also do waterproof gloves. They've got a jacket. They've got loads of stuff. Everything's perfect with Vessie. There's no point going anywhere else. So if you're gearing up for the ultimate Black Friday, Cyber Monday shopping spree, eager to snag the best steals on footwear this season, or just looking to step into the holidays with style and savings, head to Vessie.com forward slash blaze and dive into Vessie's biggest sale of the year. Persistent genital arousal disorder. Oh my God. <laughs> That'd be really rough. <laughs> You're just constantly walking around with wood all the time. You've just got to, like, strap it to your leg with duct tape in a very uncomfortable way. 
Jesus Christ. Imagine it's just a regular day. You just woke up, the sun is shining, the birds are chirping. These are trying to have sex with them. You make a cup of coffee and sit down to doom scroll through the latest news. You start reading this infuriating clickbait article about some octogenarian talking about how everything young people like is stupid. And that's when it happens. You ejaculate. I just in my past. Oh, God. <laughs> Kevin. Before the day is over, you're going to do that another hundred times. And there's nothing that you can do to stop it. Fucking hell. This condition was originally known as persistent sexual arousal syndrome, but it was rebranded in the hopes that people might take the condition more seriously. <laughs> After all, it has nothing to do with being sexually aroused or attracted to anyone or anything. It just happens. PGAD is a rare condition that predominantly affects women, although... <laughs> That predominantly affects women, though there have been cases reported in men as well. It's unknown exactly how rare the disorder is, since it's believed to be largely underreported due to overwhelming embarrassment, but there are estimates that it may affect as many as 1% of women. Good lord, really? As far as attempts to quantify how prevalent PGAD is, it doesn't help that this is an extremely new condition, at least as far as medical science is concerned. The first clinical description of PGAD was in 2001. Although it certainly existed for much longer than that, when the Greeks described nymphomaniacs thousands of years ago, it's likely that some of them were suffering from PGAD rather than hypersexuality. If you're currently thinking, wait a minute, wouldn't this be amazing? No one's thinking that. It's like, it's like, you just, no. It's like, just no. Stop it. Get some help. If Steve Martin had one wish this holiday season, it would be to experience a month-long orgasm, a sentiment many people certainly share in the abstract. Yeah, but can you imagine how miserable it would have come after a while? And before this was understood as a debilitating medical condition, doctors would often brush aside complaints from women on the basis that the symptoms sounded absolutely incredible. Another particularly gross comment one woman received from a doctor was, Wow, guys must love you. Classy, Doc. Well done. Charming. Great bedside manner there. Aside from being a highly inappropriate and unhelpful comment from the doctor, it ignored the fact that her orgasms had nothing to do with a desire for sex and were destroying her quality of life and her mental health. Of course, not everybody that suffers from pre-GAD actually orgasms. In fact, most sufferers. Did, did we have to start with this one, Kevin? It's like you're asking, you're, you're trying to get me demonetized, are you? Yes. In fact, most sufferers don't orgasm from PGAT without physical stimulation. Instead, just feeling like they're being pushed to the brink. Forced. Someone can. Forced. Forcing somebody to edge can be fun for forcing. We'll edit that out. Imagine being unable to sleep, unable to concentrate, to hold down a job, and even unable to leave your house because you've got a non stop sensation that you're on the verge of climax. It is not just physically painful, but mentally devastating as well. For those who have PGAD, their quality of life is completely diminished. Every day becomes impossible because they could suddenly be overwhelmed by the painful sensation of desperately needing to orgasm. Masturbation to the point of orgasm can help relieve the symptoms, but one isn't enough. It takes multiple intense orgasms to alleviate the symptoms, something that isn't really possible if you're working an office job doing some grocery shopping or trying to go to the movies. <laughs> Jesus Christ. That relief is also extremely temporary, with sufferers reporting they need to masturbate, every uh, masturbate 20 times a day or more just to make the pain subside. As for what causes this condition, we don't really know, though it's believed it has something to do with pressure on nerves at the base of the spine. In about two-thirds of cases, women were found to have Tarlov cysts, a type of cyst that forms in that area of the spine. When the cysts were removed, some of the patients were cured of their symptoms, while other symptoms became much more subdued. For the other third of patients, there didn't seem to be anything putting pressure on the nerves, which means that can't be the only cause. Fortunately, multiple causes means there's multiple solutions. Perfect exercises help reduce symptoms, and one woman was completely cured of her symptoms by having by taking Chantix, a pill to make you stop smoking. <laughs> can you imagine going to the doctor and he's like, I don't know, doc, can you just prescribe me something? He'll be like, sure, I'll give you the stop and smoking one. It's like, why? I don't know, it's worth a shot, isn't it? Just like, let's rotate through what's this this week. Stop and smoking. Next week, it'll be uh, just some aspirin. <laughs> week after that, diabetes medicine. <laughs> Let's see. I'm surprised Philip Morris didn't jump all over this case study advertising, keep smoking or you'll never come again. <laughs> Auto brewery syndrome. This is the one, the one about the thing with the alcohol. I know Simon has heard of this condition and he might have already explained what it is as soon as he saw the title. Bingo, Kevin, yes. Even if he didn't, the name is pretty self-explanatory. ABS is a condition in which a person's body turns into a brewery, specific their small intestines. And once again, this sounds like it would be pretty great at 
first. Since ABS essentially makes you drunk, the symptoms are exactly what you would expect. Feeling good, having a great time, and improved ability to operate a motor vehicle. Although that last symptom only seems to affect Americans. <laughs> yeah, I remember. Bing, 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 bong, 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 bong. Get those lights off! Bing, 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 bing. <laughs> What's a mate of mine? It's like <laughs> unnamed friends. We were uh, staying at a, me- uh, a friend of ours' house. And uh, he had to, he, he was like, we, we, it was all like on private land or whatever. And he was like, I'm super drunk, I'm gonna drive my car around. And it's like, mate, are you sure that's a good idea? It's not illegal because you're on like someone's private property. And he's like, yes, let's do it. He gets in the car and he immediately just reverses the car straight into my other mate's car. And he's like, oh, sorry. It's like, what, the- <laughs> what are you doing? Of course, I suppose there are a few other less desirable symptoms, as well as nausea, vomiting, confusion, slurred speech, and loss of balance, not to mention all of the hangover symptoms the next day. I got a hangover! Whoa! Unfortunately, there's one other symptom that creates a perpetual cycle of drunkenness, which is sugar cravings. Sugar triggers the brain's reward system in the same way that alcohol does, so it's not uncommon for people to crave sugar while drunk. Quitting drinking typically results in, a ma- in massive sugar cravings as well, but that's beside the point. Does it? I never get sugar cravings when I'm drunk. I'm always like, let's have some meat. (laughs) The reason ABS increasing the desire for sugar is problematic is because of how the condition operates. It's going to make you more drunk, isn't it? ABS is caused by an overabundance in the small intestine of specific types of bacteria and fungi like yeast. These microorganisms break down sugar and carbohydrates, converting them into ethanol, which is then absorbed into the bloodstream, resulting in the patient getting tud up. I am not f***ing drunk. Can you tell the time? Yes. I am not fucking drunk. And again, this seems to be that it can be fantastic. Booze can get expensive, but rice and pasta are cheap as sh. If you don't feel like getting drunk, just eat a keto-friendly meal instead. Problem solved, right? Well, to an extent, that would actually work. Cutting carbs out of your diet is one of the treatment options for ABS, along with antifungal medication and probiotics to get the balance of gut bacteria right. If you really wanted, I bet you could have your ABS treated with a fecal transplant as well. I mean, if there's the probiotics and the no carbs are gonna, if that's if that's gonna do it, then I'm not gonna have a fecal fucking transplant because I know what that means. You have to swallow a pill. Up your bottom. While it seems like anybody who might up suffering from ABS, in general, it's extremely rare. However, there are some risk factors that increase your odds, such as short bowel syndrome, type 2 diabetes, previous abdominal surgeries, and somewhat ironically, cirrhosis of the liver. But for all of you Americans that claim to drive better when you're drunk, don't think that you've just found your way out of a DUI by alleging it's just a medical condition. Multiple people have tried to use ABS as a defense for drunk driving, and on at least one occasion it worked. However, while the ethanol produced is enough to make you feel tipsy and to give you the alcohol sh- the next day, it's almost never enough to actually make you blow positive on a breathalyzer. One long breath into the bag, please, sir. Yes, I will, you f***ing champion. Oh, I kind of saw these people were walking around like really plastered, but it's just like you just got a light buzz all the time. That sounds a lot more pleasant than what I imagined, just general light alcohol buzz all the time. <laughs> Like an alcoholic, just like, hey! There is an extremely high burden of proof to show that you genuinely suffer from ABS if you try to use this defense, so it's best not to lie about it. Of course, even if a person really does have ABS, I'm not sure why this defense would work. It's a rare condition that is difficult to diagnose, so if a person knew to use it as a defense in trial, then they almost certainly would have known before driving that they suffered from the condition. The fact that they didn't actually drink anything shouldn't change the fact that they were knowingly driving under the influence. Yes, it doesn't matter how you got drunk, it just matters that you're drunk. But hey, I'm not a lawyer and America is weird. Exploding head syndrome. Years ago, Simon made a video about this condition on another channel. (laughs) Oh, I did! I remember this! This is the one where you go to sleep and you're a loud BANG! And I'll never forget my reaction when I first saw it pop up in my YouTube feed. I laughed to myself when I saw the video, thinking, holy sh**, there can't possibly be a disease called exploding head syndrome. And that, I'm sure it's a popular video because that's a hell of a title, isn't it? Yeah, I've beheld better. But as the video progressed, I made the shocking realization that, holy sh**, I have a condition called exploding head syndrome. This isn't a case of medical student syndrome either. At no point while researching this script did I believe I had autobrewery syndrome or persistent genital arousal syndrome that I can't rule out satyriasis. What the f*** is satyriasis? Is that going to be something to do with satires like those goat creatures? Hold on.
Yo, ChatGPT, my homeboy. What is satirasis? Hey there. Satirosis, also known as satiriasis, is a term that historically referred to excessive or abnormal sexual desire in men. It's the male counterpart to nymphomania in women. However, it's important to note that modern medicine and psychology does ramble on though, doesn't he, sometimes? You what? Well, that's rich coming from you. But exploding head syndrome has been an occasional part of my reality for probably 15 years now. Fortunately, the condition is not nearly as severe as the name makes it sound. It's fucking annoying, but thankfully, it's not actually dangerous. EHS is classified as a parasomnia, a group of sleep disorders that involve weird stuff happening before, during, or after sleep. Most parasomnias are things you've heard of, like sleepwalking or night terrors. But EHS goes into the group of parasomnia, simply labeled other. EHS happens as you're starting to fall asleep, you're laying there exhausted, drifting into a deep slumber and then BANG! Some extremely loud noise that doesn't actually exist echoes through your skull. Most people describe what they hear as either a gunshot, explosion, or cymbals crashing. In my case, it's always been an explosion or some other ident unidentified person screaming my name really loud. Some people, I feel like I've maybe, exper I feel like I have experienced this like once or twice in my life, but it's always like I've just been like, yeah, it's a dream. And it's, it's literally like once or twice, but I feel like I have had this. Like, more than like someone screaming your name as you're falling asleep. Some people experience other sensory input as well, such as a bright flash of light, though I haven't had to deal with that part of it. It's an extremely frightening experience when it happens and it jolts you awake so hard that it then becomes difficult to go back to sleep afterwards. I can't speak to other people's personal experiences, but to me, the most interesting part of it is the noise was very obviously not real. Even though it's startling and deafeningly loud, I never once had to look to see if somebody was actually calling my name or if something exploded and the house was on fire. <laughs> This sound has always been easily identifiable as originating in my own head as an auditory hallucination, not something external that I was actually hearing. Of course, that could be cause for concern on its own. The first or second time I experienced this, I asked a friend of mine who's a clinical psychologist about it because I was concerned I was schizophrenic or something. His answer was not to worry about it, essentially saying that when it comes to diagnosing mental illnesses, things your brain does as you're falling asleep don't count. While it was reassuring that my already tenuous grip on reality wasn't slipping even further, that's still not really an answer as to what was happening. But that's because there is no answer. While this condition is officially recognized and has a real and funny name, the name is pretty much anyone knows about it. Most people who suffer from exploding head syndrome will only experience the symptoms once or twice in their lifetimes. There we go. Okay. And when it happens, it's unpredictable. That makes it virtually impossible to study, as you can't just hook somebody up to a machine every night for years in the hopes that maybe it'll happen again and there'll be some readings to take. There have been limited studies performed on EHS, but there's no medical treatment available and the causes are completely unknown. A bunch of stuff has been ruled out as definitely not the cause, but there's no evidence pointed to anything that is actually causing the condition. Fortunately, most people only experience symptoms of EHS a handful of times tops, and it doesn't pose any actual danger other than losing out on a little sleep. While there isn't any medical treatment available, case studies show that the one treatment that has been effective in treating EHS is reassurance. <laughs> it's like just a dog to me, like, it's okay, everything's fine. Basically, all you need is for somebody to tell you, there, there, you crazy f EHS is completely harmless, so shut up and go back to sleep. I suppose it might be better to use softer language than that, but case studies indicate that this is the first and only ailment that could genuinely be put into remission simply by telling somebody to walk it off, champ. Get killed, walk it off. Aphantasia. I first learned about this condition while watching Super Mario streamer Carl Sagan 42. Chat was mocking Carl's inability to predict what was going to happen in the troll level he was playing, so he decided to perform a little experiment with us. He asked everyone in chat to imagine a red star, then he put a grid of six images on the screen, asking what everybody had imagined. Since this happened in the middle of Mario gameplay, I naturally imagined the game's invincibility star if it was red, though others in chat opted for various other types of stars. However, there was one option that nobody in chat had selected, which Carl revealed was what he saw. The box he selected was just an empty black box with no star inside it. Aphantasia, not to be confused with German operatic metal supergroup Avantasia, I don't think anyone was <laughs> confusing that, Kevin. <laughs> not confusing them with a supergroup that I've never heard of. I feel like he doesn't even know me comes from the Greek words for without imagination. And that's exactly what it is, the complete inability to visually imagine things. It's another poorly understood condition, despite not being exceedingly rare. 
Aphantasia affects roughly 1 to 3% of the population, but most people don't even know that they have it. Wait, people can't imagine things? What do you mean? I'm imagining a red star right now. What? People can live well into adulthood realizing they're color without realizing they're colorblind, and that's a condition that is much easier for other people to pick up on. People with aphantasia generally interpret other people's descriptions of mental imagery or of seeing things in their mind's eye as being somehow metaphorical. Without being explicitly told what they experienced was an outlier rather than the typical life experience, there wasn't really any way for aphantasics to know that their brains were operating differently from everyone else's. Wait, what? Wait, what? People, wait, if I told someone I'm imagining a red star in my mind right now, I see a picture of a red star in my mind. There are people who think I'm just like, not really picturing a red star, but I'm just talking about imagining a red star. <laughs> really? If that's you, you've got this disease. <laughs> How crazy is that? But because of that, there's very little research on the topic. Aphantasia was first described in 1880 by Francis Galton. You may remember Francis from the previous episode on cousin marriage, <laughs> but I, I do. But he was a British polymath, the cousin of Charles Darwin, and the founder of modern eugenics. Oh, also that, apparently. Not only was he the first person to document Aphantasia, but he noted that it was exceedingly common among his scientist peers. And then nobody really talked about it again until 2005. While research is currently limited, there is something to the idea that this condition may disproportionately affect scientists. Even Carl has a PhD in microbiology and works in a lab, making me wonder how the hell he has time to stream. Regardless, it's easy to argue that a person could be more inclined to conduct scientific experimentation when they literally can't imagine what the results of their experiment will be. It also could make research papers a whole lot more palatable. When you read a story, you're likely painting a picture in your mind of what's going on. Aphantasics can't do that, and in 2021, a study showed that they had a completely flatline response to reading horror stories, while those without the condition so showed physiological responses. I can't believe there are people who can't imagine shit and they don't know that they can't imagine things. That's wild. Essentially, those with aphantasia may as well have been reading a scientific journal. That brings us to the most obvious question you might be asking right now. Do they dream? And indeed they do, and their dreams are just like anybody else's. Aphantasia only affects a person's ability to voluntarily visualize things, not to involuntarily do so. They are still able to dream and presumably to trip balls on mushrooms as well. While it's crazy to think that this condition was identified over 140 years ago and then went over 100 years without any further research, it's good that aphantasia is making a comeback so that the condition can be better understood. Unfortunately, it's not the only thing tied to Francis Galton that's starting to make a comeback. Oh, God. <laughs> and that's where we end today's video. Thanks for being here. If you've ever used a website like WebND, then you already know that you've got cats. <laughs> Strong opening, right? <laughs>